let me say hello, everyone. It's not. So, I'm happy that it's not a great day to be outside, so that doesn't tempt you, I hope. But thank you very much for joining us for this introduction to choosing and growing roses. We're going to talk about many different varieties of roses, which both Carol and I have. In fact, um, you know, we've probably got over 200 roses ourselves in our own gardens with many different varieties. Anyway, I'm Wendy Strawn. And I'm Carol Ward. And uh, as um, Kendra said, we're both master gardeners. And what we do is volunteer with the Vancouver Island Master Gardener Association to help other gardeners. And we both share, of course, this passion for roses. But we would need to let you know at the outset that despite our considerable efforts to make sure that the information we give you is accurate and importantly for the VIMGA based on science, we're not responsible for how you interpret it or use it. Well, you can come back to us about any problems. Sorry, but whatever we have to tell you. But, it, but seriously, if you do have problems with your roses, be sure to ask questions and use the chat feature. And then we will, uh, Kendra's got to keep track of all those and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the session. And what we can to answer today, we'll, be, we'll get to find out from you who you are and what contacts we have, and we'll try to get back to you later. So, with that in mind, and why aren't I able to move this? Okay, so our, we'll get to other subject. What are we talking about today? We're trying to identify a range of issues in planning our session that we think will be useful to you and try to answer the basic question of why roses? Of course, to us, it's obvious. How can you have a garden without roses? But anyway, we want to start with the main question as in why roses and can, how can they, can they fit in your garden? Mm -hmm. And you need to begin, I think, if, rather than run off to the store and say, oh, I love the look of that. Planning is really important. And I've discovered that with experience. Where, to, where are you going to put the roses? Where do you actually have space? And what kind of structures do you have in your, in your, on your property already that might be useful to you? And what does a location need to offer? What types of roses might you think about? There are many different types, as you know, I'm sure. And then choosing ones, which roses are best suited to which location? Then we, having done that, then looked at different kinds of roses and some examples, we're going to talk about what might you look at when you want to buy roses. Mm -hmm. And also, Carol particularly is going to invest, run over this with you in some detail. What do you do? How do you grow roses successfully? And we'll try to look at troubleshooting rose problems, diseases, pests, and make some recommendations. So let's go. Whoops, I went the wrong way, sorry. Okay, <laughs> planning. First of all, where can you put roses? I'm sure that the most obvious place, of course, is in beds. And so wherever you've got place in your garden that you could actually make a bed, you, may, you can put roses. And particularly hybrid teas, Floribunda, Rugosas, all fit nicely into a bed with some perennials. If you have a trellis or an arbor or you want to build one, that's a great structure to use to uh, grow a climbing rose or a rambling rose. Fences. If you have fences that you're not very crazy about, hide it with a rambling rose that will spread a whole along the whole length of your thing. And for borders, instead of having just a fence or a green, uh, head, green uh, plants of some kind, plant roses along paths, the driveway, and you can use there a plant of hybrid tea or floribunda roses. Hedges, make a hedge of roses. In fact, in Nanaimo, they're very good at that. The city does that. They make hedges of a, a small size roses, pavement roses, and they make a hedge which looks just beautiful and flowers all summer. Um, and it's much nicer than just a picket or something. And rockeries. We haven't, we've had no luck finding miniature roses ourselves, but if you do have some, put those in among the rocks and heathers in your rockery. Oh, I'm putting the wrong things. Okay, I'm going to get the right, I'm going to get the arrows right now. Okay, talk about types of roses. You, what are the uses of particular types of roses? Hybrid teas, especially suit to be in a bed, or on trellis and arbor if they are climbers, or on borders. Shrubs just about go anywhere. Climbers and ramblers, fairly obviously, they're going to go 
very well up trellises and arbors, also along fences and also along hedges. Floribundas, they suit for beds and borders. Ragosa roses, beds, borders, fences and hedges. They are, they're very handy in fact for hedges in particular and miniature as well, you're gonna to have to put those in. Usually because they're small, they will need to go at the front of a, small, of a bed um, or in a window box or something like that. Mm. So now I've done something wrong here. So roses in beds. And while it works, I'm getting a really struggle here. Oh, I was just thinking that saying this, this isn't the only, um, these aren't the only uses or locations for roses, of course, but they are probably the most likely successful ways to use them. And hybrid roses are, usually, are often planted in a bed or by themselves, not in the midst of other flowers or shrubs. And because, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. And, but floribundas are very showy and floriferous. So they're best shown where they'll have enough space and not be overshadowed by anything else. Ragosas, I suggested these various places, uh, beds, trails, and so on, but they're also very grow, very large, and they spread a lot. So they're probably most useful as hedges and screens. But let's look at now at some examples of roses in these various locations in your garden. So roses in beds. In this case, it's a mixed bed with roses and perennials. And the difficulty there, or the, the, the challenge there, and I, this is what this is, the, all, just about all these photos are from my garden. The challenge here though, is that you, roses need a lot of air and space and they don't, can't really grow well if they're crowded. So when you're putting them in with perennials as well, then the trouble is uh, space enough for the air flow and for the roots. But this one, you know, this one did work all right. But it's a, and so it's a mixed bed. Climbing roses, they're very well suited clearly to be trained over arbors and they add height and, as, and add interest as well as beauty to your garden. So this one is just great over the front. Roses as hedges. This one is, a, this is um, uh, bon Bonica roses and they're not too large. They're a smaller rose and they grow, if you, as long as you grow them reasonably close, not too close of course, but then they, they grow and they spread out and they are ideally suited to be a hedge. Another way to make a border to define a space is to use pots of roses like these. Large pots, these particular roses are 21 in pots that are 21 inches diameter. So they're really big and quite tall as you can see. And they're with lots of good soil and plenty of regular watering. Roses can be very happily suited to stand in their home can be in a pot. In fact, these particular roses are my in my neighbor's garden and she has had these here for 10, 15 years. So has never moved them. And clearly they are doing very, very well. And I'll show you the, this, this is looking at the, along the fence or the border, it's not really a fence um, from the other side. So you can see how many flowers there are that are growing. Right. And then roses in a window box. These are the miniatures I mentioned. Which, as I say, we, we, have had, we had trouble trying to find uh, where, the, um, where, the, where you can actually find the uh, miniatures. And then roses on a fence. This is, you can barely see the fence, but it's just a, a very ordinary piece of woody fence, not glamorous, gorgeous at all. And this way, the roses are, they start, they start growing on the, um, on the inside of the uh, fence where, where these pots are, but not, I don't think they're in pots, but they may actually be a further down. Um, this is my neighbor also who's growing them like this. But then once they start to grow, you can lift the canes and move them along. And so they grow beautifully right along the fence. They can also be roses on a hedge a hedge itself, 
This is uh, a Leilani hedge, very tall and very green and pretty monotonous. So it's rather much nicer to break up that monotony. And this is a rambler rose, this is Alberic Barbier, and just beginning to come into bloom at this moment, but soon it's covered in buds and will be a very beautiful site for, well, a couple of weeks, I suppose. But this is the problem with uh, ramblers, they don't last for that long, they don't flower for that long. So we felt we have locations. You look for, first of all, where do you want to put a rose? What sort of location are you using? What, what sort of structures do you have where you might grow it? And then you're thinking about, well, what rose will I choose? So what are you looking for in a rose? How do different types differ from each other? And why choose this one and not that one? So, so choosing first. Hybrid rose, hybrid tea roses are in fact, the most popular, but they're also probably the most difficult because they are least, they're more temperamental in a way uh, and they get, they're more likely to get disease, but they are also very beautiful and they're, the, they're very long stems, large cups, fragrant flowers. So they're wonderful for cut, uh, cutting flowers and they often have deep colors and glossy medium to dark green leaves. And typically they're used in beds. In fact, typically, they will be in beds by themselves. So when you look at a rose garden in a park, you're likely to see, uh, well, you love to see a lot of shrub roses as well, but also often the hybrid teas are there and they, uh, pl they're planted so they're reasonably far apart. And hybrid teas are also, this is the one I saw before, but it's, it's a climbing hybrid tea. And this is particular one is Royal Sunset, which is very beautiful. And um, it's, uh, it's very fragrant as well. It has large apricot blooms that grow from eight to 15 feet and they spread eight to 10 feet. So it's, uh, it'll bloom all summer. And uh, it's a great joy to see. This is another hybrid tea, Chrysler Imperial. It's um, a very strongly fragrant fragrant dark red hybrid tea cultivar. It was bred and it appeared in first in 1952. So it's quite an old one, but it uh, has very large five inch across fully double high center deep velvety crimson flowers with 40 to 50 petals. So you can just imagine what a huge the cup that is. And it's a rose which has won many awards because of its beauty, its fragrance and its uh, hardiness too. And it also flower, flowers most of the summer. Shrub roses. Now, shrub roses are more difficult to define. In fact, the American Rose Society, as I'm saying here, defines them as a class of hardy, easy care plants that encompass bushy roses that do not fit in any other category. So in other words, it's a catch-all. When they can't decide what it is, it's a shrub. And it's, Although some, some have decided them and they give names. And if you look it up, you'll find that there are 19 different types that, and they're very hard to distinguish from each other. But they're very useful in different, many different situations in the garden. So when you're buying one, you need to look closely at the label to see what the characteristics are. And of course, as I've said, they're used for beds, borders and hedges. that they're no way consistent. So what we're going to look at is several examples of shrub roses growing in the garden. And what I'd like to draw your attention to is the fact that they are, how different they are. And so therefore, what would you even say about them? Now this one, the Ro Rosa Mundi is one of the famous, most famous of all garden, uh, garden roses. It's got semi-double three to four inch blooms with 12 to 18 pebbles a big difference from the Chrysler Imperial we were just looking at. But it's got a crimson background, splash red and white pink, and very gold, you can't see them there, but they're very bright golden stamens. It was named, interestingly, I think, after Fair Rosamond, the mistress of King Henry II of England. It produces nice rose hips in the fall and is shade tolerant. So it's one of the few, because there aren't that many roses that will be happy in the sh some shade but it's with dapple, the dapple uh, sound, not heavy shade, of course. And they're a very different one again. This is Anne Boleyn. 
And Anne Boleyn is a David Austin rose, and it has lovely rosette-shaped small blooms with up to 110 petals, with blooms that emerge, they're all blooms that emerge in sprays, and they're not single, so they're not great for cut roses. I mean, you, you, you could cut a bunch and put them in a vase, but they're not, it's not like the hybrid type teas, which um, that's Anne Boleyn, who's, you can know who she's, this one's named after. There is another very, very different shape. It's Borden Sunrise, and it sure lives up to its name. It's gold flowers with peach overtones, cup shaped with wavy ruffle petals, very, very pretty. And it's low, but it's low growing with a height of width of about two to three feet. And this rose is one I just got a couple of years ago. It's called Hope for Humanity. It was named for the, the 100th anniversary of the Canadian Red Cross. And it grows five to six feet tall with blooms that resemble hybrid teas. And it's very, and very, very floriferous and flower, so many flowers on it. it and it blooms all summer. Then we get up to Floribundas. They're not as popular as hybrid teas, but they produce showy, colorful clusters of flowers that open at the same time. Now this, I took this picture just this morning. And so you can see that the, where the bud, the way the buds grow and the flowers are, that they're, they're, to, they're very close to opening all of them in a few more days and then they would be doing a cluster of flowers opening at the same time. But they're not as large or fragrant as hybrid trees, but they bloom for a long time and they're easier to care for. They're less disease prone and so on. And, and this is the same rose, but uh, on the other side of the, of, the, of the rose plant. And this one, these are two that are open now. And this is, this is Queen Elizabeth. Floribunda Nicole. Nicole is a gorgeous rose, very um, different coloring, as you can see. It's a bit like Rosamundi, but not the same. And this one has three to four inch blooms, 35 petals, a crystal white brush with pink toward the petal edges. It's, an on uh, it's a really outstanding, continually blooming bush, bush with large dark green leaves. It won the Portland Medal in 1995. And in my garden has been a constant bloomer throughout the summer, but it has quite thorny branches. Floribunda, another one, and look how different it is. It's um, strawberry crush, and it's a very low growing mounding shrub with slow, uh, showy clusters of uh, scented strawberry pink flowers and strawberry straw, um, glossy dark leaves. Strawberry crush. Okay. Next category, climbers and ramblers. It's very hard to tell the difference between climber, whether a cl rose is a climber or not. And what it does has very much to do with how you care for it and whether you, how you prune it. Both ramblers and climbers, of course, for, uh, climb. They both climb. They both have flowers that could be similar. As you saw the uh, Royal Sunset, that's a climber, but it's also a hybrid tea. And this is true of many of the roses. They are in two; they can easily be put in two different categories. But the, and they, but and the climb, both climb. They both have flowers that can be similar to hybrid teas or floribundas. There is a difference, however, and the, the stems of climbers are fairly stiff, and those ra of ramblers more pliable. Neither of them, however, um, just cling on to things. They're not like pe peas, which grow a, a, or clematis, which grow a. a a, a little loop to make sure they can hang on to something. They all have to be supported by something. Climbers are often repeat bloomers too, whereas ramblers typically, I don't know of any ramblers which bloom repeatedly, but they, and so they usually bloom only once, which is like the one that I showed you of um, Alpha, um, oh God, which, I think, which one have I got? <laughs> anyway, um, on that hedge, it's, it's only going to bloom once. And they're, but there again, they're used many very good uses, trellises, arbors, fences, hedges, and also grown up trees, of course, which would, you know, if you can layer it 
and put it and it won't destroy, have enough room for its roots beside a tree, then it may climb and be just gorgeous up the tree. There we have Madame Alpha Carrier, who's in bloom right now, um, over my house and, and, and tra a tomato palace, as we call it. Madame Alpha Carrier, very fragrant, very vigorous, um, and will bloom intermittently through the summer. This is not one which blooms repeatedly. Oh, it re oh sorry, it does it bloom repeatedly, but not continuously. But it's very, it's a, it's a lovely rose, very, very vigorous. That one is about 15 years old, I guess, maybe longer. And then the rambler, Alberic Barbier, which is the one that I showed you before on the hedge. And you can see all the buds coming and it will bloom big, very wonderfully for a couple of weeks, maybe longer sometimes. But also it's quite fragrant. But it's, so it stretches itself across the hedge. And then another climber is New Dawn, which is a very popular old rose. It's um, one of the ones that, um, where is it? It's a, I'll just say, it's a, one of the, it's a traditional, much loved favorite climber. And it repeat flowers from early summer to the fall, not vigorous. Like it's usually most of these repeat um, roses have a good flourish in the spring and then they appear, blossoms continually appear throughout the summer. The new dawn grows 20, 10 to 15 feet tall and it's supposed to be disease resistant, but I find it gets a lot of black spot. I don't know what I do wrong, I don't know, but anyway, I still I have two of them and I uh, certainly like it. It's in the Hall of Fame for roses, so a very good one to get. And finally, most I think most spectacular one that certainly that I have, and I think Carol's smiling to you also, yes. is, is Dortmund. Dortmund is, I would say, practically disease-free, abundant, bright red single flowers, each with a white, bright white eye, and it grows eight to 10 feet tall. So this, in this particular case, I've got two of those, and one is on one side of the arbor, then the other, and then they join in the middle. And deadheading keeps it blooming all summer. It's rated 9.2 by the American Rose Society because of its disease resistance and winter hardiness. Um, we'll be talking about different breeders of roses because some, they're very, very different and some much more useful to us as rose growers than others. The breeders of, of the Dortmund were the Cordicea family. And in fact, these same roses were used for the development of the Explorer series of Canadian roses. And they have many of the same characteristics. So, um, and so they are a Canadian variety, disease resistant winter heart, even in Manitoba. And they're also rated high by the ARS at 8.9. Am I going too fast here? <laughs> no, nobody can tell me, I can't hear anybody else. Anyway, rugosas. Um, rugosas are shrub roses. <laughs> not surprising, every bow, most roses you can call shrub in some way. But what distinguishes rugosas are two important things. One for when you're handling them, there are a lot of thorns on their stems and their hardiness. And they're often very fragrant. They bloom all summer and in critically disease free. So almost carefree, really. Mm -hmm. you, you, you just plant them and they grow. You, don't have, you hardly have to do anything to them. So uh, one of these, Rugosa Thomas Lipton, is very thorny. And, bit, but, and so you need long gloves or more, you know, strong clothes when you go in and work with them. But very vigorous and forgiving. This particular one I brought from Prince Edward Island when I was there for a conference. And it was just one little stem, maybe a 18 inches high. And you, I had to go out on the plane, so obviously it wasn't big. And it's tolerated several moves. It's a hybrid Rugosa, eight feet tall by four to seven feet wide, and it blooms intermittently all summer and totally disease resistant. Another very popular Rugosa rose is a Hansa, and it's one of the most popular because it's also very thorny, but very vigorous and has large four inch, very fragrant double blossoms with 25 or so petals. It's very, very fragrant. It's, it's a gorgeous, deep crimson rose, as you can see. Lots of um, petals. 
Okay, you've got a place to put them. There are some varieties to think about and their characteristics. So what are you going to do when you go out and buy them? Check the plant. We're, let's imagine we're in the nursery and we're looking at all these roses and you know what they look like. Most of them are going to be in pots. And they, some of them, depending on the time of year, most of them won't have any flowers. But if you're buying now, you, there may be some that would have some blooms, blooms on. So really important to look at all these different features, the type of rose that it is, like is it a, 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 a hybrid tea, is it a regosa, is it a climber? Look at the growth details on the label and see what is it, what is it likely to do? How much space does it need? How big is it going to be? Look at the color and fragrance of it. What does it say about fragrance? How disease resistant is it? Is it a bare root plant? That, that's very hard to find, actually. Um, I don't think, I don't know if I've ever found a bare root rose. You have to, you can buy the bare root if you order them and they bring them online, but otherwise they're mostly in containers. And when you go to the nursery, you'll find they're mostly in containers. Some of them have wax stems. Now people sometimes ask, is that okay? Yes, it's okay. The, the key, uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah. The, the wax is not going to stop its growth. It preserves it actually through bad weather. And moisture needs, what are those? Root development. When you, have, when you look at the rose in the pot, try to take a few moments and see if you can lift it out of the pot. I mean, if it's very nice and moist, then that's good. But, and it may, then that may mean that some of the soil drops off it. But you absolutely want to see what's the, what are the roots doing, because especially if you buy them from some places which store them for a long time, like I have to say, like Home Depot gets roses, or some of the big bulk stores. Um, Canadian Tire is very good about taking care of the roses, but look and see whether or not the roses are, I mean, the roots are loosish, so that you could put your finger and move them around. If they're tied and circling, you don't want that. That's too, that's too dangerous. And look also at the grower's advice and see what is, what's told you on the label, if you've got a good label. So you do need to keep the label if it has one. Now they're not always, some, sometimes they just have the name and so on, but many roses do have very good labels. So I just want to look at one and point some of those features out to you about what you're going to look at as you try and buy this rose. And the, the nurseries will tell us that people don't read labels. I don't know. Yeah. It's really bad. There's a lot of research goes into preparing those labels, not just celery perfect, but also to let you know as a grower, what are you going to do with this? So this is a particularly good label, I must say. It's got a picture of the rose on the front, tells you it's um, in Mediland, which is one of the best most disease resistant um, breeders, hardy ground cover disease resistant. And look at the, an image of sun. So, and when does it bloom? Summer and autumn. So it starts then. Whoops, I've gone the wrong way again. We go. So here's the back of that label. So it's a landscape shrub rose, it tells us. It's a black, it's a ground, uh, breaks through a ground cover rose breathing, black spot resistant controlled habit and clear versus this is one this is a particularly amazing rose I don't know it is just spreads a lot and it is I guess it's a ground cover in a sense because it's low growing but anyway it's got lots of beautiful foliage as well in the fall and its shape it spreads its mature size is two feet by which I can't read that on my screen but whatever it is and it flowers all through the summer Oops. Uh, through to the autumn. And then in the label, look how this is also really useful. And, and so you need, it's worth paying attention to how, to, what size hole to do, where to put the to, uh, root ball top, what, to, what soil to combine in, and so on. And, and then what to do to take care of it. And they've even given you diagrams. So this is a really fine label. They're not all like that, I must say. Some just tell you the name. And then you have to Google it and look it up, find out more about it. But growing your rose is, so I'm going to hand over to Carol here. Yes. 
Um, first thing you need to do is decide where you're going to put your, your rose. The best location would be in full sunlight, but not too hot, no cold drafts. Uh, if you're going to plant more than one, about 24 inches between the plants, a warm breeze rather than a ice cold gale, um, plenty of light, well aerated, but water permeable soil with humus and rose, moist, but not wet soil. Um, roses, it seems like cool shady roots, much like clematis, which I didn't know until recently. I have one that I think is having a problem in that respect. And you want deep soil for deep roots. Once you've decided where you're going to put your rose, then you need to, as Wendy says, choose a good plant. You want healthy green wood, smooth, of course, unless it's waxed, um, good, strong growth, foliage free of disease. The plant must, should be well watered and it should have at least two or three mature branches. And then you want to, when you get your rose home in your container and you've got your site located, you work on your soil, or you can work on your soil ahead of time, but you want to prepare your site and you want to, uh, the best idea is to dig it over and add some compost so that you get a nice fluffy soil that's going to retain water, nice and porous, deep and loamy. So then when it comes to planting your rows, you just need to dig a two inch by two inch, pardon me, 12 inch by 12 inch hole and um, you've already got your amended so soil there. You can put um, compost into the uh, hole, but you don't want to use manure. If you use manure, that's fine, but you don't want it on the roots. You, it will burn the roots, so don't do that. Um, when I took over my rose garden, there were roses in, in existence, but they, I never did figure out what they were. So I've ended up taking them out. Now, when you remove a rose, you can't put another rose in its place for three years unless you remove all the soil. So that's what I did. I dug down and took out the, the, soil, the existing soil and replaced it with fresh organic compost, composted soil. Okay, so now we're ready to plant the rose and we've dug the hole and it's, uh, the best time would be late spring or early summer for planting a rose. You've added your compost. Uh, you do this when it's dry, digging, digging your soil and, and everything and adding compost when it's dry. Um, before you plant your rose, you want to soak the pot, the pot and the rose for at least two hours, maybe more, to make sure it's good and moist. Then you want to put it into your, a good idea to put a little bit of uh, you can even put uh, sod or something in the bottom of the hole or a little bit of compost just to give it something to go on. Some people add gravel or sand, uh, not sand so much, but gravel for air, uh, for drainage. Put your rose in gently and gently place the soil around the roots. Make sure you don't damage the foliage or the roots and make sure that the the uh, top of the rose where, where it has been in the, in the pot is level with the top of the uh, bed that you're putting it into. So it's not too deep and it's not sticking up in the, in the air. So you've put your soil around and you fill in the hole, fill in with nicely enriched soil and then you tamp it down gently to remove the air bubbles. You water, you water with about a gallon per rose for a week so that it's well and truly watered and it should be draining properly because you've made, made good soil. And as Wendy has already said, if you're putting it in a pot or a tub or a container, you want a 20 by 20 inch pot and you do have to water those more often. They will dry out. Getting to a watering of your plant, um, you water, it's better 
to water deeply rather than a shallow watering every day. So just e even if you do it every few days or more, of course, if it's really, really hot, dry, or if your soil is sandy or dry. Uh, you, may, you don't want to wet the leaves of a rose. If you were to wet the leaves, you would want to do it in the morning and your site would be such that your rose would dry, the leaves would dry off before, so that they don't uh, be, become mildewed or, or have, give you problems. So that, that should work. Um, feeding your rose. Well, you want to feed it first in the spring before it buds out. And you want to, you're providing nutrients for the leaves and the buds and the flowers to grow. I use alfalfa pe pellets around the base of a rose. And I also put on a bit of composted manure. Um, I use chicken manure that was recommended by one, one grower. And I do the two together because we have dogs and dogs like to eat alfalfa pellets. At least our dogs do. <laughs> so I put manure on them to de give them the idea they don't want to eat that. Um, when the first flush of blossom has finished on a repeat bloomer, you want to feed again. And by this time in the early, well, summer, maybe end of June, July, I would start feeding 686 miracle Grow. And again, I use a water soluble, A, it gets to the roots faster than a granular, and B, dogs don't eat water soluble. <laughs> so we, we do have a problem with, with animals. Um, modern roses seem to need more plant food than the old roses. You want to continue feeding possibly during the summer. I do sort of hit and miss now and then when I figure it's been too hot or they, they look like they could use a, a little feed up. But you don't want to wa uh, feed past August because that's when they're starting to go into dormancy. So that's when you stop using your feeding program. I think I'm done, am I done? Mulching, okay, mulching. We want, um, this, this picture shows a mixture of bark mulch and compost, composted manure or compost. You want the two together because the bark mulch itself doesn't have any nutritive value. And you want to, you want to provide a mulch that will suppress weeds, keep in moisture, but you also want something that will break down and eventually feed the rose. So a combination of the two is ideal, or you can use compost or dried, I should say dried grass clippings, which my dad used to do, and or um, chopped up straw, which is another option. So you are, providing food for the, for the plant. And it, make, it makes it look nice, keeps the weeds down and provides humus for the root development and the microorganisms that will help to nu provide nutrients for your plant. Okay. We're Thanks. On. I mean, there are many different mulches you can use out there. I just find that um, putting, as you suggest, as you're saying, putting a not quite decomposed um, compost, that, that seems like it always is going to provide a lot of nourishment for the plant. And wood chips help to protect, protect, keep stop weeds as well. So they and they do, but they don't decompose as fast, of course, either. But there is a good, there's many different kinds. So part of the choosing a mulch is aesthetics. Like, what do you want your rose, when you look at your rose bed, what do you want to see? Not, you want to see the roses mostly. So putting a, a, the mulch on that draws attention to itself is sort of counterproductive. I mean, it may do the job of mulching, but on the other hand, when you look at it and you see this messy, like I find straw, I like grass clippings too. But um, are they very? They can get very hot, can't they? Don't you find, Carol? That, well, um, I use, I use uh, straw. I don't put it on heavily. I don't do a lot of mulching, actually. I have a lot of um, undergrowth uh, 
perennials that, yeah, as you saw, my, my garden was full of pansies. <laughs> so yes. she don't see any mulch, she see pansies. <laughs> mm. Johnny jump ups, they're everywhere. Yeah. Um, I use it a lot and I use wood chips mostly because I don't, I want it to look, I, I like, I want the appearance to be pleasing. And if I have, to, if I have mulch that really draws attention to itself, then it detracts from the appreciation of the roses. So I, I, I use, I use a lot of wood chips for that reason. And they are, they do, they do the job quite nicely. Okay. Um, finally, in terms of care, we go to this very contentious, difficult task. I know everyone is, in fact, when we have questions about roses at our clinics, people say, how do I prune? When do I prune? Which ones do I prune? And so on and so forth. And really pruning isn't that difficult, but it is, it's not, it's also not that straightforward. And the time when you prune and the amount of pruning you do depends on the rose. So it's not a one size fits all at all. Because hybrid teas bloom on new wood, you want to encourage new growth. So pruning before growing gets in, the, when before the growing gets going in the spring, it's a good time to prune. And that's the usual recommended time. And ever blooming in uh, Floribunda ro roses also bloom on best on new wood. So a best pruned down in the spring, down to about 18 inches. Now, I, when you look, go around the gardens or and around Nanaimo, in particular or anywhere that has a, a commercial garden, you'll see sometimes the roses seem to be cut very, very low. Well, it depends, on, again, it depends on the rose. But my feeling is that 18 inches, 12 to 18 inches off is about right. And you want to be able to leave it so that it's got some no buds or nodes on, on the stems, because those are the ones that, uh, from which the new branches and stems will come. But um, the point is that if you cut the old wood down, ready for the new wood to come, it's the new wood that will produce the blooms. So that's why you want to make space for that to come. Now ramblers are different. They bloom once and they're on old wood. And so if you're going to prune those because they are a nuisance, they're getting too big. And again, this is, I guess this is repeating part of what I said earlier that you, you prune in order to control the shape. And if you don't want to have this rambler just wandering everywhere and keep going like that, then you need to cut it back. And I know Carol was saying she, she has a rambler which grows up is it on a fence, Carol? It's on a fence, yes, and it, it's a very narrow space. And if I left it and unpruned, pretty soon it would be a jungle and I wouldn't be able to get through. So, and mm -hmm. my, da my dad has uh, always taught me, even with a climber back in the day, I used to cut, after they bloomed, cut them back to um, three to five really good canes and take out all the rest, all of the ones that had flowered, all, all the little weak, weaklings, which I will be doing soon because my rambler is going to blossom soon. And then I will just clean it right back. Yes, I will be seeing the, the ugly fence, but so be it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, you, you said you cut it right quite down, not down to right, the ground I exactly, right down to low. Yeah, see, I mean, the rambler that I showed you, um, um, I still call it Barbie, Albert Barbie on my hedge. I have never, really never pruned that. It's, it's grown over the hedge and now it's going down the other side. And, and it it's blossoms not in your way. Because it, pardon me? It's not in your way. <laughs> no, it's not in the way and it's uh, it continues to flower. It's not that it, it doesn't need pruning for shaping in, the, in this case nor mm -hmm. for encouraging flowering because once it's died back, which it will do in a couple of weeks, then it will, I mean, I could prune some of the, if it's getting in the way or it's damaging the hedge, which it isn't, I'm happy to have it where it is, but it's the pruning for a rambler will be just to tidy it up and keep the size in check or always to take out dead stuff, always taking out dead or diseased or un unappealing stems. Those you would automatically, that's the first thing you always do, is to cut, to take out dead canes, old canes, grumpy looking canes, 
and, and clean that up. And then you decide what you want to keep that will grow well for you. Well, you're Shrub looking, roses, sorry? You're looking at, a, at a, a plant there that has no growth on it, really. Whereas- No, no, this is, yeah, that's right. This yeah, is when a, we start pruning in the middle of March, March 17th usually is the date. By then, many of the roses have developed beautiful buds and you think, oh, look at that nice bud at the end of the, the cane. Shall I leave that? <laughs> and you, the, the inclination is, well, that's the best one, we'll leave it. But that isn't how you prune. You prune back to a more- <laughs> yes, yes, And that's yes, hard yes. to do. <laughs> yeah. Actually, on, the, on these, this example, the, the, the question with it is because Roses will need, they need air. As I mentioned, that's one of the problems of putting uh, roses in among perennials and so on. Yep. They need air, good airflow. So the idea is to prune them so you get an open vase shape. Now these still haven't, these haven't, they've been cut back obviously, but they're mm -hmm. not necessarily finished the pruning. But you could see, I think just barely, it's true. You can probably see new the nodes where the, by the stems are going to come. Um, on these, there's some little pink dots there yeah. somewhere, and uh, it shows you that these these are where the, where the new stems will come, the new growth will come out of there. And ideally, because you want an open plant, you always you look down that stem and you pick a place where the node the node, which is the growth mode, is facing outwards. So rather than um, cut off just where the one is facing inwards which will make the stem go in, always do it on the out. It doesn't mean that the one that's in is not going to grow, but the most thing is it encourages the one, the oxen which is in there will be encouraged to grow from there. And I can see that there, and in fact, on one, one of these on the side, you can see a small bud already. They're already beginning to bud. And there are probably some stems in there which would want to be cut out again a bit more. I find that the pruning, taking out all the old stuff first, then having a look and see what's disease, then have a look at the shape and do it again the next day and then the next day, mm -hmm. because trying to do it all at once. I don't know about you, but when I cut, when I pick my green beans, whole beans, I can I go through that and pick out the beans and I think, oh, I've got them. But then if I go back about three, even 10 minutes later, there's some more. It's not because they've grown, but it's hard to see. And the shape and to see the rows, you want to keep looking at it a few times so that you you really see it and then prune some more. So don't I don't usually expect to prune one any plant just once. It's always to go back and have a look. Anyway, shrub roses, sorry, they usually don't prune. You certainly not when you have a new a new shrub rose, let them develop first, let them grow first in it for at least two years, and then take off a third of the oldest canes. So in other words, what you're going to do when you're pruning a shrub rose after two years, you still want this oaken shape, but you leave all, you leave tall canes and just prune off a third of the canes. So this way you've got a variety of lengths of canes and the rose will grow and be very attractive that way because it will have a variety in its shape. Climbers, you prune off to take off damage and dead wood. And again, you fl after flowering, always after flowering, you're not going to try and cut off your flowers, are you? So you, let you prune the climber after flowering, again, to keep control of the size, because some of them are very vigorous and they'll just grow too much. And then you, then you won't enjoy them because they'll be all stems. And this is one of the problems of some roses, they get all, all they are is these stems and the flowers are way high up at the top. So you want to prune them enough to keep flowers coming. And that's why you try to have different heights of the stems so that you have flowers coming on uh, out of the stems, new st uh, branches coming all the way up the plant. Unless you want to have just a, uh, a, uh, like a tree, a tree stem. They're like pillar roses sometimes are pruned all the way up the stem because they want just to have the flowers at the top. But uh, again, the pruning is to control the size and the appearance and always to remove damaged wood. 
Okay, so um, there probably some of you will have questions, more questions about that. That's fine, but uh, please put them in the chat and we'll see what we can do about them afterwards. Troubleshooting, rose problems. This is some people sometimes feel discouraged about growing roses because they think they've got so many problems. I don't think either of us, as I said, we probably have 200 roses between us. And I mean, I think that they're one of the easiest plants to grow, the most beautiful, hardy, long lasting, and reward, so immensely rewarding. But there are, it's true, I have to admit, there are problems. And one of them is black spot, which is a big nuisance, and powdery mildew, and then aphids. Um, I was saying to Carol the other day when we were talking, I, I've never noticed aphids on my roses. So what happens yesterday, I went out and had a look at one. What do I see? Aphids. Anyway, they were easy to just rub off. And there was only on one rose too. Uh, so I haven't checked all of the roses, but I, it's unusual for me. But anyway, black spot. So what to do about it? Well, pick up, take off the leaves, try to uh, uh, take off the, all the leaves or as many as you want and don't, and don't let them just drop around the plant because it's a virus, it will, or a fungus, it's a fungus, what am I talking about? It's a fungus and they, it will spread. So you want to remove the leaves and put them in a bin. Don't put them in your compost, burn them, put them somewhere else, somewhere where it won't matter that they've got this fungus on them. And powdery mildew, I don't know, I use so safe as soap for the powdery mildew. What about you, Carol? I don't have a lot of powdery mildew on my roses. So. No, I, I don't either. So I'm just saying I would, but I don't, I haven't even had that. A milk, a milk and a water solution, or I think is something I've, I've tried. And mm -hmm. black spot is a, a problem right now. I'm, every day I go out, I see more black spot on more roses and I'm getting a little concerned. Mm -hmm. Well, it's unsightly. And it is a problem because it will, it can really damage the rose, whole plant yes. eventually. Yes. So, but it is, I think, removing the leaves, especially I find removing a lot of the immediate, when the black spot appears on leaves early in the spring, taking those leaves off, that new leaves come back and they haven't got it. They're not as effective. In fact, one year I bought this very expensive rose from the Rose Center in on Denman Island. And I, it had every leaf had it was a new uh, rose every leaf had black spot and I was totally frustrated I phoned them up and I said what's the matter with this rose of old <laughs> black spot everywhere and they said well we've got some and there's no black spot anyway so I said fine so I took off every single leaf oh. and left just the stem and that was the end of it I mean I felt a bit you know it was a bit drastic to take off every leaf because after all how would it feed itself but it was just fine. It made a big difference just taking them off. And the new leaves came, they did not have a black spot. Um, aphids, I've just said, I didn't, haven't had a problem. Weather, wind and rain, what to do about that? Rain, there's not much you can do about. Protect them, shelter them if need be, if it's very bad. Wind, tie them up. You have to put a, you'd have to put a support of some kind and tie them back. Do you have any other suggestions there, Carol? Um, for the aphids, just washing them off with water. Mm -hmm. Wash the aphids off. I'm, I'm not much on squishing them. <laughs> I use I use just pour some water over them with a watering can or whatever. Yes, 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 yes. And yes, picking up the disease. That's a problem. That's a, a chore, picking up all those diseased leaves and, and uh, all your black spot. But it has to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I i don't know. I, I have this um, intention to pick up the leaves, the yellow flat spotted leaves that drop off. Mm -hmm. But with all the roses that I have, it doesn't always happen. It's, it's, no. <laughs> and as, as for the, uh, the wind, one thing I could mention is uh, my, my rose garden is protected from the wind, more or less, by a windbreak made of Therese Bounet shrub roses or hybrid rugosa roses, which works beautifully. They were there, I did not plant them. <laughs> and they're very beautiful. It's a very beautiful windbreak. 
but it does protect the, the roses to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're, we're <clears throat> excuse me, nearly ready to take questions, but we have a few bits of advice. Number one, number one, number 10, number eight, number nine, number seven, every single label your roses. And not only put the name of the roses, but also the year that you plant it. It's really interesting and valuable to have a sense of when did this rose go in? Why is it so little? Why is it so big? You know, you can understand them better, and, but put labels. Labels are a big pain. Some of them don't stay on. I found that the best way I could keep mine labels so they didn't rub, wash off was to spray them with a varnish. I use metal and uh, scroll it on or pencil it on and then spray it with a clear varnish. And that helps preserve them a lot. Anyway, labeling is always important. And then buy, buy disease resistant varieties. And, you know, the label will tell you that. And if it doesn't, then just Google that brand, that rose and, and see what it tells you about it. Um, also important, check the plant in the pot at the nursery. Don't just be, a tr don't just think, oh, it looks healthy. I'll get this one because it's a lovely rose. Look at the pot, put, try and take it out of the pot so you can see for the root uh, thing. And of course, read the label. And not all razors, labels are equal, I must say, it's true. And the one that I showed you is a particularly good one. But anyway, finally, enjoy your roses. <laughs> Don't be afraid of them. They're very forgiving and very rewarding. Okay, Kendra, do we have some questions from the chat room? All right, some questions for you both. So you covered a few of the questions. Um, so we'll go to some, this is an interesting one. Are there any shade tolerant roses? Yes. Oh. Are there what? Shade tolerant. Yes. yes. Well, uh, the, uh, the one that I mentioned was um, the, um, the first one that I showed you, which is pink and white. That is, no, I wouldn't, I don't know what we mean. Depends what we mean by shade, doesn't it? Like there's no rose that will grow in deep shade. They just don't. And there are some roses that will grow in modest and moderate shade or will don't require six to eight hours of sunshine. So it, it can be a shady area and it gets dappled sun. Um, that Rosa Mundi will, will be all right in, da in dappled sun. Um, okay. And you have, you know one, Carol. That will... Yes, shade roses require four hours of sun. Yeah. And uh, so, some that are shade tolerant are Abraham Darby. Ballerina, our carefree delight that you showed, Madame Cecile Brunet, and Sally Holmes. And Allegro. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, there are others, of course. Okay, oh, great. Yeah, there are. Yeah. yeah, I have a friend who has uh, a very shady garden, and she, she thought she could never grow roses, and then she's, now she's got a number of them because... She just found different varieties. So there are, they're available. Yep. So again, you know, I'm going to recommend to you, use the internet, Google shade, roses for shade. Our, 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 um, it's just impossible. There are thousands of roses. And, I, you know, we just don't know the names of every, everyone and so on. But that's yep. how you can find out particularly. Great. That's a wonderful list of names. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is, one of my David Austin roses uh, doesn't seem to get to full flower. The buds come and then they shrivel and don't go any further. Do you know what that might be due to? Mm -hmm. it, it, some, it I wondered about what that means exactly. Like it, mm -hmm. I was looking at, um, sometimes it, that can be a botrytis and that will make the rose rot, the rose bud will be rotting inside. And so it will, it will fall apart. I don't know if that's what's happening here. Okay, it's what would that be due to? Would that be due to mm -hmm. overwatering? What would that be due to? Is that due to overwatering possibly? Or? It could be overwatering, or it may be that overwatering is, yes, it, I mean, and that wouldn't be, the botrytis wouldn't necessarily be caused by overwatering. Over it's usually, that's usually a very fuzzy kind of um, coating which goes on the plant, and it will not be, and it would affect the, the buds. But um, overwatering will reduce growth for sure, and it will stop flowers from flowering, from opening. 
Okay, great. Um, Hopefully we can find out a little more from that bit of advice. Um, the next question is, uh, do you know what it might, do you know what these little worms might be that destroy the buds and then wrap themselves in the leaf just below the bud and seem to curl themselves into the leaf? Do you know what that might be? Sorry, say that again. I didn't catch all that. Uh, do you know what it might be? A little worms that seem to eat the buds and then wrap themselves in the leaf below the bud. Do you know what kind of pest that might be? Is that a, a, spit, a spit bug? A spittle bug? Okay, possibly spittle bug. Could be. Okay. Uh, and then another, the next question, does a lissom help keep the aphid population down? Planting a lissom around the base of the roses. Does well, that I, don't keep know, I don't know about a lissom, but I do, do uh, some people recommend garlic and onion. So I put plant chives and I have garlic in, in with my roses. Okay. And that wouldn't sap too much of the nutrients from the soil taking away nope. from the roses? No. Nope. They're shallow enough. Although they say you're not supposed to plant tulips next to the roses, which I just did this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll, you'll, you'll know. <laughs> because it disturbs the roots, but I'm not going to touch them again. So. <laughs> okay, yeah, you'll find out the hard way. It'll be an experiment. Yeah. I thought that was a great idea. <laughs> yeah, it'll look beautiful anyway. It was, it was lovely. <laughs> the next question is, I have a climber that, get, that gets thrips every year. How do you discourage that? Thrips. <laughs> I don't Oh, thrips. Yes, difficult. yes. How to discourage thrips. Thrips are very difficult. They are. Um, I, don't know. I don't know how to suggest you actually discourage them. Okay. That one, hmm? that one, they might have to do a little research themselves. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Okay. What about this one? Well, can we find it? Um, if we're not able to answer a question like that in a is sufficiently detailed. Can you, is it some way to find out who asked that and we could send them an email? We'll look it up and find them an email, send them an email. Okay, we will, yeah, we'll try very hard to do that. April can probably do that behind the scenes. Yeah, All right. you, can, you can send me an email and then I can pass on the question if that works for you, Wendy. Yes, Perfect. that would be great. Yeah, because that's an interesting question. I haven't I encountered thrips myself. No, I just know that thrips and other plants, it's a big pain, but I'm not sure what one would do in particular about roses. Well, with most things you remove and destroy. Okay. Yes. That's yes. Right. At least yeah. control yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, think, Thank I mean, you. I think of scale. When scale gets on a plant, ah. you just have to scratch it up, scratch, use your nails and scratch those off. And they are just amazingly, um, e they're easy to get off, but they're, me you know, goofy on your fingers. But anyway. Next, just, I believe same, that's true same with aphids I mean aphids you can just remove them and yeah. get rid of them yourself with uh, just with your fingers move them off even though they're a bit gluty but okay that's good because we do have some questions about aphids and how to do how to remove aphids in a bee friendly way so yes just physically <laughs> removing them or using water would be bee friendly yes use it if you use a fairly strong spray of water that will dislodge them. And they don't come back. They'll drop onto the ground and that's it. Oh, I don't know why they don't come back. They don't. <laughs> uh, hmm? Something about thrips. They apparently breed in the grass or they drop down and, and, and come, come from a grassy area. So if you have grass near your, your roses, you might want to remove it or cut it back. I noticed I, I had problems with one of my roses and there was grass growing underneath. Not mm -hmm. by my choice, but I pulled it out. But the rose is doing much better. Great, good, good advice. Mm. Uh, the next question, do you know of any small fragrant David Austins, like three feet or less? Like three so feet or less? Mm -hmm. oh. oh my goodness. I don't they think they have a rose in a thing three feet. Mm? Okay, <laughs> yeah, I think they, well, I think, I think this audience member had a, a strawberry fair. Ah. and thought that that might be a smaller one, but it's gotten up to six feet and they were hoping they it would do be that. smaller. Okay. Well, is it, if sure. it's a requirement that it be David Austin? Mm. Uh, is yeah, that what they, she asked for? Yes, yeah, I mean, they, they did ask for a small fragrant David Austin. Yeah. Hmm. Well, the, a small fragrant, low growing 
uh, rose, pink, that pink rose, the one that I showed you, strawberry crush, is quite fragrant and low growing. I'm not sure there was a, a David Austin. Strawberry crush, right. okay. Strawberry crush is a lovely, low growing, abundant flor um, flower, rose, I should say, which I, I think it's a, one of the floribundas. Okay, mm -hmm. nice. Uh, another question is, do you know if the new Cordes roses, K-O-R-D-E-S, Cordes roses, are they disease resistant and fragrant? Are they which? Disease resistant? Absolutely. They are, they are one of the breeders like Mediland and Cordes both produce really excellent roses, very vigorous. I mean, I don't know if they're, Cordes does the knockout series. Knockout roses are another one that's very disease resistant, very fragrant. It can be fragrant and also um, hardy. Excellent. So oh. cordis for sure we'd recommend. If you, if you find a cordis rose, that's worth looking at. Yeah. Great, okay. I don't suppose they're all equally fragrant. I mean, not all roses are equally fragrant by any means, but they may be beautiful enough. Right, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, another question about a pest, the weevil snout beetle, weevil snout beetle, how to control. Any advice on that one? <laughs> Don't know that one. Oh, I know where... Okay, that one too. Maybe we I should haven't, get I haven't, I haven't encountered that one. Okay, weevil snout beetle. Well, maybe we can get an email out about that one. Oh, that's a... Yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah, that's okay. We can't. Uh... I think you hand pick the, the like a, a it's like a weevil, and you hand pick it. Okay, hand pick them off. Uh, soapy to... water helps. Right. They chew on rosebuds if that's if I'm in the correct place. Yeah, I I don't oh, have I just to... like you Sorry. say. There's a lot of commonalities of, about controlling everything, right? Just removing and. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Physically. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I've just found my little list here. Thrips. To discourage thrips from attacking, you spray the plant um, just before the buds open with a systemic insecticide. If signs of thrip damage appear, remove, that's always the case, remove <laughs> and destroy sure. infected flowers and buds. Spray infected plants with an insecticide. And there are ones that are perfectly acceptable for organic gardening too. And if it's a, if it's a severe infestation, then you repeat. But you know, if you have a plant that's doing that, you might want to change the plant. Oh, if it's that bad, I mean, Hard I don't know. It depends. It. I mean, you know, it's obviously if you just bought it and it's very precious, then you want to somehow get rid of the thip, flips, thrips. <laughs> you can. <laughs> Um, to say, but an insect yeah. uh, systemic insecticide will, will help. Well, that's a good point. Sometimes the problem just gets so bad that maybe it's just worth removing the plant. You don't want it to yes. infect the other ones, I guess. Mm. Right. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, a completely different topic. Any suggestions on how to propagate from cuttings? Oh, have you? So that, Propagate that from cuttings. I think you know that's quite a technical thing. It's um, I would want to find a, um, I'd want to Google that and find a a, a di an explanation of what do you call that thing? You have all the you can look out and somebody somebody's posted something which explains and shows you demonstrates. That's the best way to do it for sure. To watch somebody doing it. It's, it's one thing to tell you. I mean, in a, you can look up in a book or, I, you know, we yeah. could tell you, I suppose, what, what we might do and what, how you do it. But it's much more useful to see somebody do it so that you can then imitate that. And also because when you look at it, looking at a YouTube video, for instance, if you can do that without having all those ads, um, somebody is showing, there are really some expert people showing you absolutely doing, doing the job. Right. I don't know if I put, I gave a list of um, references. Oh, okay, and those might have been uh, mailed out. Oh, there they are. I, oh, look, I haven't got, um, that's too bad. I didn't find one for propagating. But okay. if you look up propagating roses, you'll find countless YouTubes, which are, right. people will actually show you what they're doing. 
And some of them are well, are, are very good. Some of them are just like your guy down the road who thinks you'll make a video. But a lot, you know, if you find one that's by someone who knows what they're doing, a, a, someone who works at an, at a nursery or like the uh, Royal Society for Roses, something like that, they will show you exactly how to do it properly. So I would really recommend that. Great advice. Okay, thank you. Um, are roses a, a good one if you have deer around or do deer particularly like roses? <laughs> they love them. <laughs> oh dear, is that right? <laughs> yes, somebody, somebody sent a question asking about whether deer will eat, is that maybe this is a question of they eat roses or whether they'll eat climbers. Well, you know, I think if you're going to have a climbing rose outside, let's face deer graze and they mostly bend their heads down and then they some they don't climb up to get food. They will just they will just do it at their own level. So they'll take off all the lower roads. If you look at a um, <laughs> a hedge, for instance, even a, a not a laurel, but a, even a, um, an evergreen hedge. They will, you'll see all the leaves have been clipped down below ground uh, up to about four feet, and then they don't go any higher. So that would be true of a climbing rose too, but you'd have to protect the initial stem. And then you'd have to protect it from the horns because then, the, <laughs> then you have deer come along and rub their horns on the stem. But I mean, in terms of eating, um, they, they will, of course they will eat at all the lower levels. Okay. If you, so just don't, or plant to, uh, you can always try a rugosa. I had one my, that Thomas Lipton was outside, not outside my fence and available to uh, deer when I plant, first did it outside because they're so thorny and they're not, they're not the kind of fragrance that the deer likes. So that it will not, doesn't want to get its nose all hit, spiked by thorns. So sometimes some rugosas that are thorny enough will discourage and they won't get eaten. Oh, great. Okay, great advice. And then we have someone uh, letting us know that uh, a good place to get bare root roses is Cottonwood Nurseries and Coombs. There oh. you go. We're oh, talking about good. bare root roses. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. Yes, um, yeah. And another piece of advice, um, baking soda, cooking oil, and water as a spray for mm -hmm. pests on roses. Okay. Mm -hmm. Be friendly, yes, probably yes, be friendly. And um, okay, some more advice on thrips. Um, let's see. People talking back and forth to each other. Yes, definitely. Deer eat rosebuds usually before they bloom. Oh, dear, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, and then another suggestion about the, uh, the, the weevil beetle uh, to come out at night with a flashlight ah. and spray with raid. Oh. <laughs> Otherwise, they go underground and can damage the roots. Okay. I'm not sure about that advice. Mm, or um, you could go out, you know, to catch the weevils. It's these things about going out at night, like finding the slugs and everything. It's a little bit of a pain. But if you, you can hand pick small weevils, it's true. And if you go out with a jar of soap, excuse me, soapy water, and then drop the weevils into the soapy water, then they will. Um, they'll drop to the ground and then you can carry them, you can get rid of them that way. Great. So you have to, I mean, if you've got a real problem with weevils, then you might want to go out with your jar of soapy water and knock them off into that soapy water. Hmm. Thank you, great advice. I think we've covered the questions. Um, again, uh, for those of you who don't feel that your questions were answered, um, check the references. April has sent you a great handout with, um, uh, references that are curated by our experts, uh, Wendy and Carol. So take a look at those. Hopefully those will answer all of your questions that we didn't get to, but I think we've covered most of them in the chat there. Uh, before we go, just a couple of things. Thank you so much, Carol and Wendy. That was excellent. And I always feel like I should uh, call the nurseries around town and warn them that people are going to come and <laughs> come and get some roses. Uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, I think right now is the perfect time of the year. Like you said, late spring, early summer. So right now is a great time to go out and, and try a new rose or two based on what you've learned today. Uh, it is you... because also they're going to be, sorry, they're going to be, they're much more likely to have a few hints of what the rose actually looks like. They'll have some buds or something. 
Whereas when you buy them very early, there's only bare canes. So then you really have to do your homework and look up and see what, what is this rose going to be like? How big is it going to grow? But take care of all of the questions which we, uh, to things we suggested you pay attention to. Right. Thank Once you, you figure out where it can go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wendy.